Uh, first of all, welcome to the Independent School Show Summer Fair. I think this is our fourth one of these. Uh, and we've got a particular focus on the 11 plus, 13 plus entry point today. Uh, and, we're, and we're starting off uh, with a talk that we've done in various different versions at, at all our shows recently, which is what it, what it means, to, what, what a rigorous academic school is like, uh, whether it would suit your child, um, and, and to a certain extent, we'll talk a little bit about how you might prepare them for entry as well. Um, but I think the main aim with this morning, with the first talk this morning, is to kind of talk about not, how these schools differ and how they're similar uh, and the kind of children that flourish within them. And I'm really delighted that we have, um, rather appropriately, three A's to answer this question. Uh, so we've got uh, Anna Paul, who's head of Southampton High School, uh, Andy Mayfield, who's uh, director of admissions at St Paul's, and Adam Pettit, who's head of Highgate School. So we've, we've got two from North London, one from West London, uh, all three uh, very well uh, regarded uh, top London day schools. Um, and so I think before, before we get into some of the sort of nitty-gritty questions, I'm going to ask each, each, each of these uh, panellists to talk a little bit about their school in a couple of sentences and just tell us where, where their schools are, uh, what kind of children they have in it, in the broadest possible sense. Anna, do you want to keep Thank it you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's really lovely to be here. Adam and I were saying we braved the journey uh, across the river to venture to the south side. So it's really lovely to come this far and be with you today. Uh, my school, uh, as has been said, is South Hampstead High School. It's an all through school from ages four to 18 for girls, unsurprisingly, given the name, based in the leafy uh, suburb of Hampstead. So very well connected to trains and tubes and buses and all those things. So we have girls coming from all over London to to my school and I would characterize it as a place um, full of joyfulness, full of uh, girls aiming for the highest academic standards but also doing that with a playfulness and a lightness of spirit that we really value within the school. Adam. Hi everybody, um, I, I know this part of the work is on one of my running routes that I go from Highgate all the way through so I'm going to show off, we run to, through to Kew and I've never got into the Hurlingham Club before, I don't play tennis so I'm really delighted to be here and have a look inside. <laughs> uh, so uh, Highgate School, so we're just north of Hampstead Heath, I'm on the other side um, of the Heath from South Hampstead, uh, a co-educational school, we are three schools in one, a pre-prep, a junior school and a senior school um, with uh, now, we've, in case you've got long memories, uh, we were uh, once upon a time a boys' school, but for the last 20 years we've been a co-ed school. Um, gosh, I didn't realise I was going to have to sort of sum up all my pupils in one go. Um, they're, 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 they do love North London. North London has a certain buzz and bite to it. Um, and the uh, parental body, the carer body, is feisty, uh, determined, um, time poor, I would have said, and looks for... Um, the best possible childhood, given those complexities. And so my job, I think, is to make sure that um, neither the 11 plus, nor GCSEs, nor A-levels, nor applying to university destroys childhood um, and make sure that children come out of it as lovely, happy people, despite what um, maybe uh, parents and others feel they need to do for them. So more on that later, but that's, I think, what we are. Andy. St Paul's, St Paul's is an academically selective independent day school for boys. It started as a tiny little school for 153 boys in a small building around the back of St Paul's Cathedral in 1509. And it's now a slightly larger school for a thousand boys aged 13 to 18. They, uh, they occupy a 110 million pound school that we've just recently rebuilt on a 42 green acre site, which is located in southwest London, on the banks of the River Thames, right next to Hammersmith Bridge. So if you've watched a boat race and ever seen it go underneath Hammersmith Bridge and gone, gosh, there's a lot of green playing fields here in the middle of London, those are our green playing fields there. And I suppose I'd, I would say that the, the school's a busy school. Uh, the boys uh, get engaged in a lot of work, but they also get engaged in a lot of other things as well that they enjoy doing. Um, yeah. Great. So I'm going to start with you, Andy, because I've, I've asked you this question before. Um, but uh, travelling around this morning, I, I came on the Northern Line uh, and then, on the, then here on the uh, District Line, and there were lots of students coming in from quite long distances going to school. Um, North London Line is the other way you come here, and, and it, it, 
that makes all sorts of schools in London accessible. So mm. you want to talk a bit about where, just very briefly, w where you recruit from? In OK, we're, we're particularly lucky here in, in, oh, in St Paul's in that we have four tube lines that come into Hammersmith Tube Centre, which is just 15 minutes walk from us. And we also have Southwest trains that come in one mile or half a mile south of us as well. So lots of boys. We're well connected from the North Transport in London and the South Transport in London as well. 50% of our boys come within a five kilometre radius of the school. 80% of our boys come from an eight kilometre radius of the school. And wouldn't it be good if 120 came from 12%, but it isn't 93% come within a 12 kilometre radius of the school. And we have 5% borders. So they come from decreasing circles of radius from around the school. But generally they come from central London, the Hampstead area and southwest London as well. So it's good a slightly different spin to ask Adam the same question, but do you have a, a notion of what a, a maximum journey should be? I mean, if you're a parent considering a school, how much time should ch children spend commuting? Well, I, th I think a lot of it depends on the age when the children are starting. So, so some of our children are starting with a four, some are seven, and I think that the, a, a long journey for them, more than 20, 25 minutes, is, is not great. Um, it also means, because it's not only the journey to school that they're going to be doing, but it's the play dates where the friendship group's going to be. The older the children are, probably the longer um, the commuting will be. So 16 plus children who come to us, they might be traveling from further afield mm. um, and they're, they're making their own decision about how long they want to spend traveling. But I, I, it is quite a personal choice. But if you're traveling 40 minutes either way, you're sort of getting to an hour and a half, you're adding five times a, a week, 35 weeks a year. It's quite a lot of traveling you're doing and you're thinking what you could have been doing with that time. Um, but uh, distance is not the same as time it takes. Mm. So if you don't know North London, it's quite good to sort of come and um, to explore a bit. I mean, there are a huge number of buses coming in. We've got the Northern Line as well. Um, but some things that look really local and actually takes forever, coming across from Hampstead, in fact, if you're silly enough to, to be <laughs> to using that particular road and rather than walking across the heath, a um, bit of a nightmare, where some other places you can be quite a long way away can actually get there. We run school buses as well um, to, to help that. And we're always trying to, to fill in the gaps in uh, TFL if possible, because we really don't like it when people drive. We think that's the worst possible thing um, uh, that one can do for the environment and indeed for the young people's expectation of travelling. Um, so it's probably more time than distance, but we are very, very local. Um, I obviously see boys jumping on buses to go to St Paul's and I see um, um, uh, young women going off to, to South Hampstead and one notices the uniforms and the other way around. Um, but but I, I'd say we're, we're pretty local and then up the Northern Line. And I, when somebody says, oh, I just love how I get, oh my goodness, they're wonderful. And I say, where do you live? And they say, West London. I say, well, I can tell you a lot of other very good schools because honestly, that seems to be a little <laughs> bit taking you know, school choice to a level of craziness, which I'm not quite comfortable with. <laughs> um, girls, similarly, are they, how, how far do yours travel? Uh, yeah, I would say up to around an hour. I mean, as I said, we're very well connected with the Jubilee line, the Metropolitan line, the overground buses. As Adam has described, North London is really well connected from a public transport point of view. Uh, we do have fundamentally quite uh, a local community at the heart of the school, I would say. So quite a lot of the girls do live relatively nearby. Some will walk, cycle, very similar to Adam. We really promote um, parents not driving their children to school wherever possible um, and also support the independence that the children get from doing that as well. So I would say up to around an hour, um, we recruit from a whole range of different schools across London and beyond, but at the heart is quite a local community as well. So the, the takeaway message for, from a parent point of view is that actually there are a lot of very good schools within 45 minutes to an hour from where you live. Um, and we've got three here today, but there really are, if these three turn out not to be the right ones, there are an awful lot of other schools as well. London is incredibly well served for independent schools. And I, I think that's quite an important message because you can get fixated on one or two schools that you know about. And it's important not to do that. And particularly, you know, the ones that, are, that happen to be the big schools near where you live. But, but, but being aware that Quite a lot of children travel distances is quite an important thing. Um, I'm going to ask you just to, I'm going to throw one of these at each of you because I, I think otherwise we'll end up taking forever trying to get through these topics. Um, let's start the other at the other end. And, and how diverse are your schools? Hugely diverse. I mean, obviously, the fact that we're in London um, is a real benefit from that point of view. We have children coming from a whole range of backgrounds, both in terms of the countries that they originate from, but also in terms of their economic demographic. We're highly committed to our bursary programme, uh, which is really important to us in terms of widening accessibility of our education at South Hampstead. We have, in terms of thinking about the sort of origins of our pupils, we have wonderful um, diversity initiatives led by the girls, uh, which are 
really powerful within the community. Uh, lots of recent things um, that resonated. Uh, a recent one was our multi-faith um, assembly and followed by a multi-faith bake sale, which was hugely enjoyed by the community for lots of different reasons. Um, but fundamentally, I think South Hampstead is a school that really celebrates a whole range of different cultures, backgrounds and contexts for individuals. And that's a really strong part of what we do. And I guess you would say the same, both of you. About no, I don't think I would say quite the same thing. <clears throat> Um, not least because I obviously like to say something different from something you've spoken. Um, uh, I mean, Highgate, um, um, Haringey is there are 32% of uh, young people who are black and there are just under 2% of our children who come from black families. So I would say that our diversity, one of the major drives that comes from pupils and from parents and from staff is that we need to do better in being able to uh, get people to consider us anew and afresh. Um, and we're, we're working with the African and Caribbean Education Network and I'm sure others are um, to try and get over the barrier of um, uh, com coming to a school where you're going to have a, a minoritized ethnic experience as a young person. That doesn't mean to say that we haven't got um, a real sense that those children are coming from um, minoritized ethnic groups aren't very happy, very successful, but it is ultimately very, very different um, to be in a majority white population. And, and I think we're very conscious of that. I think we've become, uh, we've become increasingly comfortable with that discomfort and the way of talking about it and addressing it with, with parents and carers and with teachers. Um, that said, there is a broader diversity within, within London, which is reflected in Highgate. And certainly I see the changing demographic of applications and visits and people accepting places um, in the younger years. Um, and when our heads of school last year, who happened to be um, elected by others from minoritized ethnic groups, went to talk to the junior school about their experiences and about how microaggressions can happen and what you can do as a young person. It was uh, quite interesting that the seven and eight-year-olds were saying that was quite um, foreign to their experience, the kind of things of racial stereotyping and assuming that because you were a, a boy born in Pakistan or his parents born in Pakistan you're going to be good at cricket, that wouldn't happen now. So even in their lifetime they were seeing those changes. So the drive to be diverse I think is there, but the reality is that fees are expensive, um, schools like ours are expensive, um, they're selective, so you're putting quite a lot of filters and then if you're, as we're, we're I think we're born, we were started in 1565, so are we older or younger than you? Younger. Mm -hmm. younger. So we're younger. So even though we're new to this game um, compared to St Paul's, um, uh, we, we have a long history of being a, a white school. Um, and that really is something that we've uh, wanted to, to, to take and make sure that it doesn't um, impinge upon young people's experiences. Oh, thanks, Adam. That's really interesting. And uh, um, I, I can ask Andy then a, a different take on, on diversity. What, what about um, neurodiversity? <laughs> it's funny you should say that because that was the point I was going to say when you say anything to add. I was going to say, yes, we have neurodiversity within our community as well. So we, we obviously we operate at the high end of academic achievement, but within there we've got lots of interesting children that have got some, they're good across the curriculum, but they have some very, very extreme diversity in some ways. They're very able, perhaps in mathematics, we've got one child who's exceptionally good at computer science and quite, uh, quite different to a lot of the other children. But the beauty I about that St Paul's is the fact that the boys accept it all, uh, accept all these children within them and welcome them in and, and recognise the talents that these children bring. So we have uh, all, all these boys, probably, I would say, uh, have got a, a educational assessments to say in actual fact where the, in what way they're diverse so we're admitting to them to the school you know that they're going to thrive within the school but then they're respected and supported by the school as they go through their time with us and there's a large team of people that work with those boys to make sure that they're accessing the correct education in the classroom and also importantly in the exam rooms as well you brought up the thriving word which is there in the title so i, I go throw this one at adam Let's, 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 I mean, that kind of is the real topic of, of this session. We, we, we now know that you can come from a reasonable distance, that, 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 you could, that the schools are trying to improve their diversity, uh, and that neurodiversity counts as well. Um, but but th there is an awareness that some people thrive in this type of education, and other children perhaps don't. So do you want to talk a little bit perhaps about, about who it suits? Oh, who high gate suits? Um, yeah. Well, I, I always... The, 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 um, the thing that I find is that in the, in the run-up to a selection process, let's say 11 plus, um, most parents and carers are saying to themselves they would just like to find one school for their child and they, they, at that point they would be able to relax. And the way in, or, in order to do that, they, they apply to several different schools and so they put themselves and their children through you know, a not entirely child-friendly business um, and the children can come away really... Um, not only are their tests to pass, but they've got their parents to, um, to fail as well, um, because their parents are obviously wanting the best for them. 
afterwards, once the offers go out, you find that um, these children that we're offering to tend to be offered to by every school, um, and the and parents and carers are in that. Another thing, I don't remember anything uh, anything sensible that anybody said. I'm now completely at a loss to know which school I should choose. And so there's one set of psychosis that takes place for the first six months, and then for, the, 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 for happily for only about three weeks, there's another psychosis that can send people into a tailspin. And I find myself saying, Actually, school type really doesn't matter very much. And it's terrible marketing. And my, my admissions team who are sitting in the audience are probably at this moment, they're saying, oh, for goodness sake, shut up. Get him off the stage really quickly. <laughs> but in a, order to take the temperature down, I think what is really important is, is, is to say that um, it's the stability of the family unit, not the type of family. It's the um, love and affection that a child can have. It's access to enough playtime and um, you know, good food and, and being able to have a stable um, place to live and so on. Those are the things that really matter. And then the quality of education. And you know, I can say that um, in these two schools, I've never met anything other than well-educated, interesting people who've graduated from them. And when I've occasionally tried to steal their teachers to come and teach at Highgate, I've never been anything other than wonderfully impressed by them. So you know, in terms of the quality of education between us, there's not a really a piece of um, paper you could put between us. Um, so I think what I, what I hope is that given that I do this kind of spiel on a regular basis is that my, what I say means that the parents who are going to be the key aspects, the really key aspects, um, the ones that I would not like to be in the school, the ones who are absolutely dreadful, go elsewhere. And I only get the nice ones. I only get the ones who are really going to be in tune with what matters to me and our staff, which is obviously the, the excitement of learning and the, the, the sense that we don't drive people towards exams, but is a, you know, a sense that this is the one child of you have. And so if you concentrate all your energies on what it is to be young and what it is to learn, in each school in the difference in the way you do it, then children will thrive unless parents get in the way. So I am the person that parents tend to listen to most. So I spend a lot of time talking to parents about how to do this parenting business in 21st century and how to be able to shake off the imposter syndrome, not worrying this about this being a select, academically selective school, knowing that we'll have a range of abilities within it because if you're selecting children at four and seven and we don't trade up, there will be a whole series of um, diversities and interests there. And then I can get the whole thing just to be much happier. Um, and, you know, I mean, obviously there are the WhatsApp groups and the rest of it, but, you know, Parents ultimately, you know, are um, susceptible to reason. And so we, we, we make children, once we've dealt with that, then everything else can thrive. <laughs> OK, so, so we, we've got the, the holistic view of thriving, which is definitely true. But, but, but you do select children, don't you? And so, so, so on some level, you're making judgments about who does or doesn't thrive. So how do you make those judgments? Who, who do you think suits your school and who doesn't? So I think it's it's definitely a range of different factors. I mean, I just would echo uh, elements of what Adam just said in the sense that when we're making those decisions, we are fundamentally looking at the children that we believe will be happy with the type of education we offer at South Hampstead. And that is so important that you foreground happiness when you make your decisions for your children, because once that is in place, everything else will come. I believe really firmly that that everything will flow from that happiness. So when we're thinking about who will benefit most from the education we offer, we're really thinking about who is going to really relish um, the sense of curiosity that's foregrounded at the school, the pace. You know, it is a busy school, as um, we had commented on in relation to St. Paul's. You know, it is a busy time for the students and they need to be able to thrive on that sense of energy, um, that sense of everyone being busy and doing things that they love to do. And they need to have an outward looking perspective, be willing to embrace all the things that are offered within the school. But fundamentally, I think it's actually, um, in a way, a very pastoral decision when you're deciding who to admit to your school in that you are thinking really carefully about making a really good ethical decision for that child in terms of believing they will be happy in the educational context in which they will sit for, for several years to come and at really important formative years um, for their childhood, which of course sets the tone for adulthood as well. So, of course, there are different factors that go into it. The exam is entirely relevant. Having said there are lots of pastoral elements, of course, the exam is relevant too. But I think things like the interview, the way in which they, they respond to the questions, their sense of energy and enjoyment of that experience are also important to us. And, and, and seeing that they feel they can smile and be a part of a community they love. I've asked Andy this question lots of times before. I'm going to kind of drill down even more because I think, like, if you're a parent with a say, say you've got a child in a primary school and and they're sort of, you know, they're doing okay, is that enough? What 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 what, what what's needed? Like, how can you tell that your child actually will suit one of your schools? 
Okay, so I, I, parents often ask me this question when they come to the school and I'm talking to them in my office. What are you selecting the children on to the school? And I say they need three things. Firstly, they need to be able to keep up with the pace of the education at the school. Um, it's no good taking my Honda Jazz to go and race on the Formula One circuit. I just won't keep up. It will just be out of, out of kilter. So you need to be able to keep up with the pace of learning. So at the end of the day, if you've had eight lessons, you've mastered what's been going on in those lessons. You're not sitting there going, I remember what was period one, I really enjoyed period four, but what happened in two, three and five? I've got no idea. And I really need to go and read over that French grammar again because I haven't really learned it. You need to, at the end of the day, feel as though, yeah, I really enjoyed eight lessons and I've understood everything it is and I contributed in all of them as well. I could keep up with it and when my friends asked me questions about it, I could answer them. And I gave the best point that the teacher asked in Latin. I gave the right answer. So feeling you're keeping up with the curriculum. The second thing is, at the end of that eight period of day, some people will probably set you some homework to do at night. And rather thinking, I wonder who's going to win out of, is it going to be Arsenal that's going to beat, uh, gosh, I've forgotten Man who they played. <laughs> Man City. Who's going to win, Man City or Arsenal? I mean, and I, uh, what's going to happen on the Saturday afternoon? People will be thinking, and actually, yes, that's great, I will do that. But before that, I really do need to do some work. And I've got some work to do in biology that I'm really looking forward to doing. So the ability to actually fact, want to do the work as well, because you can have bright children that don't want to do the work. You can also have children that want to do the work but necessarily can't keep up with the pace. So those two things have got to go hand in hand, the capacity for learning and the ability to keep up. And then the third thing I think that all of us would say that you need at the school is the ability to want to do something else as well. So it's not all about academics all day long. You want to go and play football or you want to go and play netball or you want to go and actual fact and build racing cars or you want to do whatever it's going to be, play, play the tuba, whatever it is that you want to do. But you have to have that drive as well. So I think you'd need those three qualities. Now, to go back to Guy's question that he put there cunningly in the, in the primary school, if you're at an independent school, then the head will probably take you to a side at some point in year five and say, in actual fact, we need to have a conversation about appropriate schools and the number of appropriate schools. And they will then say, a child of your ability, and they'll look at the numbers that you have that they probably looked at in CAT scores and progress tests in maths and English and all those other things that they spend time going over. They will probably say, a child of your ability and is doing this well at our school, we would recommend that you apply for the following schools. That's a bit more difficult in a primary school because in actual fact the heads probably wouldn't be sending many children to independent schools. They might have sent one or two and the year six teachers, the year five teachers may have knowledge of previous children that have gone to them. So they might be able to steer them and say, yes, your child is sort of top of the class in actual fact and they would thrive at some of the independent schools or way top of the class and they may thrive at these ones. So you may get some experience from your teachers at primary schools that might be able to guide you as well. They may have done some other assessments as well in terms of CAT tests that may be able to give you some numbers. Just to give you a ballpark figure for St Paul's, you would be looking for CAT score in excess of 130 if you wanted to apply to school. So finding out where your children lie at primary school would be a useful indication within their class. Secondly, any numbers that you've got that quantify their academic potential would be helpful. And I think the third important thing is what they're like when they're around with you. Are, are they asking questions the whole time? Are they wanting to know? So they look at a cathedral and they go, my gosh, somebody must have invested an enormous amount of money 500 years ago to build St Paul's Cathedral. Wow, it must have been a really big, important thing in society then, with lots of people actually about doing it. And so many people must have built this amazing building, rather than thinking, gosh, it's just a big pile of stones and doesn't it look pretty? Actually asking the questions around it, trying to contextualise it. But asking questions when you go on holiday, why are we going here? What happened here? But also reading the news, understanding what's going on in the world. If they're that kind of child that's interested they're obviously interested in learning, they're obviously interested in thinking. And if they're also interested in doing their homework at school, from school as well, yes, they're all starting to tick the right boxes that mean they might be right for an academic school. Long answer, sorry, Guy. No, no, it's a very good answer. And I, 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 What I started thinking was, I mean, what you're discovering there is not your, your child's lifelong potential. I think that's quite an important thing to stress. What you're, what you're, what you're really discovering is, is what your child is like at 11, 12, 13, and how they might do it at a particular pace in the following school. Plenty of people do brilliantly later on who were terrible at 11, 12, 13. I mean, it's not, it's not, and there are plenty of people who, who get fantastic GCSE results and, and then have pretty washed up adult lives. So, so it's not that what, what's being determined at that age is your child's future. It's, it's just working out whether they would suit this particular kind of education in the teenage years. I think, is that, would, that, would that be a fair? That, that was a really helpful, uh, I think, for, for anybody applying to an, um, an academically selected school, state or independent, it's really helpful, um, that sense that we, we are fishing in a sort of, in a, at a level of cognitive validity quite similar. Um, and we're looking for children who can take on board a, an academic curriculum because they're, whether we're doing nine GCSEs, 10 GCSEs, or whether people are opting out GCSEs, um, most of us are, are, 
are assuming that what you're looking at is, and while I don't think it should be about grades, you know, in old money, so A stars, A's at GCSE or eights and nines, are, is now what most parents would be expecting if their children came to schools like us. So therefore, we need to make sure that we are taking on children who will be able to take that in their stride. Um, and then in the sixth form, we run an A-level program and we expect all children to be able to um, to be able to take on four A-levels for, for, for the first year 12, and then if they wish to, to reduce to three. So there's a sort of a, there's a sort of baseline academic level, which you'll find out in the ways you're talking about, or indeed by sitting, you know, 11 plus, for example, but making sure that you've got other options alongside it. Um, I think wh where I would come in, because the young people um, coming to us are a little bit, they are a little bit younger. I mean, so they're, they're going to be 10 years old, most of them, when they're making their choice, or, or indeed six or seven. Um, what I'm looking for, I think, is um, a sort of family fit and approach to the way they're going to spend their childhood, um, which is to say that they will take pleasure in everything that their children wish to do, and they will be excited about the entire curriculum, um, and they haven't determined, predetermined, the what, what would look like a good outcome. So I spent quite a lot of time saying, why are you asking me about the Oxbridge results or the numbers have gone to Harvard um, or the BMO, the British Maths Olympiad? All of those things take place and they're fantastic. But to tell a 10-year-old or 11-year-old that the way that you are going to measure the success of yourself as a parent and them as a child in those ways is not great when they are you know, don't understand those things. And at the moment, really want to be taking pleasure in what is it you're doing at the moment? And if they come bouncing back to you and, and you've never been particularly um, fasc <laughs> fascinated by art or you've never got involved in um, languages, but you find your children appear to be really relishing that, that is fantastic. And I hope that children are you know, jumping out of bed to go to school when they're sort of in, in year seven and eight. Um, obviously, you know, adolescence kicks in and, you know, jumping out of bed is not something anybody yeah. does. You know, age 14, you know, to tip them out and if, you're, if you're lucky um, and walk across sort of all that detritus you have in the bedroom. And blah, blah, blah. You know, I've got you know, children who've done all that. But, but, but it's, it's, it's a sense that um, you, you haven't hemmed in the creativity and the ambition and the excitement um, of the curriculum. Now, we, we are... I, I do say to, 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 to parents who try to understand, well, you know, if, if this is true, why are your exam results, you know, all of our exam results so good? And I say, well, but an exam is not the starting point. If you teach to an exam, it has a distorting effect on the way you wish to teach and what you wish to teach. So you need to have a vision, which means clarity over where you want to take the children. And part of where you want to take the children is where they also want to go, because you want them to... Um, engage in the discretionary effort um, that make, will make them ultimately incredibly employable. Because if you're doing things that Im impresses your employer, you tend to get better jobs, you tend to get more reward. And so that's some of the language we're talking about. But we're dealing, dealing with um, bright young kids young people who are very similar, I think, in their outlook. So I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to get the people who w embrace that. And it's very honourable for certain people to say in a different kind of school, no, actually, we're very clear. We want it to be about exams. We're not quite so worried about the extracurricular and so on and so forth or the engagement with pupil voice or whatever it is. And that's just slightly different family by family. And the worst thing you can do is to be sort of square peg round hole as a family in a school. Um, I actually think the children are incredibly flexible um, and adaptable. And actually, what they, they wander into schools and they find they're full of adults telling them what to do um, with lots of people they get to know really well. It's actually the, 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 the interface between the adults running the school and the adults bringing up the children. It's really important. So listen to what you want. And if there are two of you bringing up a child and disagree, that's not up to me. You have to sort that out yourselves. <laughs> okay, well, we'll have w one last question for Anna before we, before we th throw it open to the floor. Um, um, so by what age do you, do you reckon that a parent will be able to work out whether they, their daughter would suit your school? I mean... Um, I would have thought towards the end of year five, you'd have a good sense by then of the sort of the, the traits and excitement your child is showing about education, the types of things that makes her tick, that makes her passionate about what she's doing. Of course, you may also have boys. Apologies. I, I tend to talk about girls because I have daughters myself and uh, I'm in a single sex school, of course. Um, but I, th I would say about towards the end of year five would be the point where you'd really be starting to think about which schools you might choose for them to apply to and where you might think they would really be suited for thriving throughout secondary education so so it's not a register at birth type scenario no absolutely not it's definitely not that you know that's not something that we do um, at Southampton and I'm pretty certain my colleagues don't either and we really would emphasize the importance of understanding what makes your child excited passionate what drives her or him to really succeed and excel and feel that sense of pride contentment happiness that we've talked about already this morning it's really important to have a sense of that before you embark upon your school choice, um, particularly for secondary education, I think. OK, so we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Um, does anyone want to ask one? Any hands up? The one up, up there. Can I ask what you do about how 
Sorry, we, uh, we, we repeat it with the microphone. We're, we're having trouble hearing. Sorry, can I ask um, what you do about out-of-year children, perhaps when they were younger, because they were August birthdays, they were advised to be in a different year group, and does that affect at 7 plus or 11 plus or 13 plus entry? Who wants to go for that one? I'm happy to take take it. I mean, where it, each school will will have a policy uh, and that they will operate to in their admissions policies, and they will have it very clearly laid out. I mean, my school, what we do is, in actual fact, um, we consider pupils that are out of year, but we like them to fall within certain categories. So, for example, if a boy has relocated uh, in the middle of his education, if they're coming from the southern hemisphere, then in actual fact the education, sorry, the education works on a different part of the year. It works January to January and to December. It doesn't work August to September. So, in actual fact, you need to work out that six-month accumulation. They may have joined in a different year when they transferred across. There are other children that have been medically ill. Uh, at some point and had an illness and then have had to slip a year. So in actual fact, so they, they're, they're a year behind. So what the general approach is that we take in broad, broad stroke is if there is a valid reason why they are out of year uh, and they're in a different year and educationally it's the right time to assess them, we will. But we wouldn't assess a child if he was out of year because they've been trying to, parents have been in effect trying to game the system. So for example, you tried to get into our school in, in year six, you didn't make it, I'll resit year six again and try again next year and I'll keep on resitting year six until I actually get in. So if, if there's a good, valid, justified reason for them being out of year, then when the appropriate time comes to sit the exams, we would sit the exams. We would have issue, I think, if they were two years out of date, because in actual fact, as you go through the year, as you go through adolescence, in actual fact, being two years out of date makes it quite difficult socially within a year group. Adam, I'll a quick question while, while people are thinking. Oh, there's one up there. But, but while the mic's going around, English is a second language. Do you, do you make allowances for that when people are applying? Children need to be able to um, ac access the curriculum um, with the English skills that they have. We have quite a lot of children who have English as an additional language and quite a lot of our children speak more than language and it's ve quite varied whether they're speaking English at home or not, they're speaking English to both parents or both carers or not. Um, we, our learning support department um, supports children who need that but you'd need to be at a the majority because we're not a boarding school the majority of our families have already decided to settle in the uk they're already employed and working here and so therefore they're they're, they're coping with a um with, with the english that they need to have as families so we don't come across very much but there is undoubtedly we, we do spot that if one's um the language one learnt to read in originally was not english and, and one's education has come later, that you still need to be, even though children can be doing really well in English language and English literature, there will be support that is needed there along the way. Sometimes it can crop up quite suddenly yeah. when it hasn't need, been needed there, and we're, our learning support department is, is there to do that. Great. It's a question at the back. Yes, I was just going to ask, um, if a child has, like an August-born baby, has managed to go into the year below, do they go through in secondary school according to their age or...? the next year in their education? Uh, I think, well, do you want a quick I'd say, one sentence summary? Or? I'd say it's a case-by-case case situation, and the best thing to do is, as soon as you're conscious you might be interested in a school, is to approach that school's admissions department. We'll then be able to um, pr produce the policy response, but if the policy response isn't a right one for you and you need to be able to ask more questions, we'll be able to give you the information that you need and, and just get in touch with them and they'll be able to do that. So most people will have a, something like admissions at or a button on the website and you can then go in and, and get some information before um, the time your child sits a test. And definitely make use of being here today to go around and talk to schools. It's an individual, you know, each school has their own policy. There's a question here. I was going to ask um, the extent to which, and obviously it's very case by case with each child, but the extent to which those children who are state educated, generally speaking, up to say seven and then perhaps 11, how, how, how quickly and to what extent that gap widens in your opinion, uh, as opposed to if they were in the independent, se independent sector right from the start? That's a very interesting question. Is, can I just yeah. check that? Is that after they started our school? Uh, no, no. No, it's, I, I suppose, so for example, in my case, my daughter's quite young, particularly for today's purposes, but if, if so she, she'll probably stay in the state, state sector at least until seven, as I suspect a lot of other kids might. And it's that sense of, you know, that ridiculous parental fear that you alluded to earlier of like, oh my God, they're falling behind, the gap's getting wider and wider and they'll never catch up. Clearly it's like case by case with each kid. 
but the I'd, I'd love you to speak really honestly and eloquently about well, certainly honestly about um, yeah, well, the, uh, yeah just, just just how how big that gap is because I feel like it's something that people don't talk about or don't even look at you know even though but I think a lot of us probably really worry about it I know I do well funnily enough if you ask them the same question about Oxbridge they might have a different answer but the question really is do you do contextual admissions I think I think the um uh, it's a, I, I'm always asked that question um, because in any one a group of parents, there'll be parents who've made the choice to send their child to um, uh, up to the age of 11 in, to an independent school or, and generally, although they're not all selective, they'll be preparing children for tests and for families who are in primary schools, um, whether that's at seven plus or 11 plus, I think we're in the same thing. Um, we don't, I mean, the, 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 to be, to be brutal, that's not, I don't know it's being brutal, but the, the difference I see is between parents who are able to pay the fees and parents who need bursarial support in the, um, uh, attainment that will have been, uh, which is available sort of at 11. Um, so uh, while there, are, there are definitely there is a way in which children who have been prepared for tests navigate them, we try to write tests that spot potential as well as mastery. Um, and that can be either child's in a primary school and has had access to tutoring, or a child has been in a prep school um, or an independent school which has been preparing them. When, when, when it comes to year seven, uh, which is therefore new to everybody and it's got specialist teachers um, who are going to be taking them through from age 11 through to 18 and who understand where the curriculum starts. The, the, the cognitive development of children is so different when you're dealing with things um, in year eight and I'm uh, sorry when you're eight years old or nine years old. So if you come across the Tudors when you're in year um, in, when you're much younger and you come across the Tudors later on you would have just approached in a very different way. So actually the content um, of what's done in a primary school or in a prep school is rarely very significant in terms of what children need to do subsequently. Attitudes, literacy and numeracy, clearly there need to be, but those are already sorted out by the time you're doing, doing those tests. But even our maths um, syllabus it doesn't take for uh, um, granted that the attainment that one sees is actually very deep uh, because it could be machined as it were, rather than, so we, we start again in year seven in ways that make sure we can allow some people literally do something for the first time and others really to understand in a deep way, but also think that the way that you get mastery is not just by being tested. So, so those early years are not so they're, they're critical in many, many ways in developing children's social skills, in developing attitudes towards learning, in making sure they don't have bad attitudes. But I don't think you need to worry about having made the choices. And there are very good choices on going on either pathway and not just the financial ones. So I really wouldn't worry about it. And we see the numbers replicated and the numbers applying, the numbers succeeding, the numbers then going on. And in the senior school, I'm very, apart from <coughs> the, the fact that, you know, one notices siblings from the junior school, I don't really know. I mean, I teach in year nine, I really can't tell who's been where. Um, at that point. Can you put a number on it? Sorry? Can you put a number? Like what percent come from primary, state primary school students? Um, I've got my head of admissions. I'm going to sort of, I can eye, eyeball him and say, can you ask John? But I mean, my my guess is that it's, in terms of the proportions, it's exactly the same. I think we're seeing um, about 40% um, uh, from girls are coming from state and 60% from um, from uh, from state uh, from for a private sector boys I think it's a little bit closer um, and I've seen my 11 plus coordinators nodding so 40 60 in favor of okay great that's cool so. similar with yours uh, uh, it's a sort of 25 to 30 percent from the uh, maintained sector but just to build on something Adam said you know what I would really say you know when you're having those worries about you know will it matter if my child's been in the state system I would say Please, if there's one thing you do, please foster their curiosity and their, their just outwardness and their willingness to absorb um, like a sponge everything around them, regardless of the type of school that your child attends. That is one of the best things that you can do for them as preparation for the education that you may wish them to take part in later in life. And I think that is one of the biggest gifts you can also give to your children as well. So we're, learning, uh, we're running out of time, unfortunately, for questions, but um, we're learning something very interesting, which is that, that girls... Parents of girls are perhaps more likely to put them in an independent system younger than boys. But maybe that's true. I don't know. Um, is your percentage similar? Is it 50-50, roughly? 50-50. Uh, uh, at 11 plus, 50% apply from state schools, 50 from independent schools that generally finish at 11. And believe it or not, 50% that join are from independent schools and 50% are from state schools. And we find great kids also joining us at 13 from state schools. And we also find great kids joining us at 16 plus from state schools if Brilliant. you're great and you're bright and you're clever and you enjoy work, it doesn't matter which school you're in. You can come to you can you can come to these schools and join them at any point. That's fantastic. On that really positive note, I'm going to have to draw a line because we're running out of time. There is another talk here at eleven 
on um, on the 11 plus and pretests. Um, so if, if you're interested in that, do stay put. Otherwise, I'd ask our speaker. I'd like to give our speakers a round of applause.